which will count down. Paul, welcome to the Astro Ben podcast. How are you? Uh, great. Thank you for inviting me on, Ben. Oh, thank you so much for uh, coming on. Um, the, the, the multiverse is something I, I, I've always wanted to talk to someone about because, you know, this being the Astro Ben podcast, I speak to a lot of astronauts and space industry leaders. Um, but the multiverse is, is very much a niche that only select very smart people can get their heads around. And I'd love to I love to talk about it because to me, the only knowledge I have is what I can get from TV shows like Rick and Morty, which, uh, you know, I'm not sure if you're aware of it, but it's a fantastic cartoon that talks about the multiverse and the adventures of Rick and his sidekick Morty throughout the universes. Um, but yeah, perhaps tell me what is your definition of the multiverse and, uh, and, and where, where did it come about? Well, believe it or not, Rick and Morty uh, is, is a fun show, but it's not always 100% realistic um, <laughs> about, about the ideas of multiple universes. And in fact, there are a lot of uh, cultural ideas about mo the multiverse. Uh, people imagine encountering alternate versions of themselves. They imagine uh, encountering superheroes with different qualities. Uh, you know, various versions of villains, the Marvel villains and so forth. And that's something that's fascinating to think about because people wonder all the time of the question of what if. So they might say, what if I chose a different job? What if I uh, came, you know, was involved in a different relationship? What if I moved to a different city? These are all things that people ponder. And that's what the appeal of the multiverse is. Now, that said, the scientific idea of the multiverse is very different. It's designed to answer several questions in physics. One is, why is the universe like it is? And why are the parameters, you know, meaning the constants of the universe, set the way they are, which uh, turns out to be uh, ideal for the development of planets, for the development of living beings, and so forth? If the constants were very, very different, then we wouldn't be here and we wouldn't be talking about it. So one way of thinking of that is to imagine multiple universes and thinking of our universe as one of an array of possibilities, and then to say, well, among that array, which of those would be able to grow up and develop uh, you know, living beings that could talk about it? And that's called the anthropic principle the idea that we can uh, weed out other universes based upon the fact that, you know, the great, great bulk of, of all universe models would not end up with people or intelligent beings to talk about them. And, uh, you know, that's one way of looking at the multiverse. Mm. So we should be very lucky uh, that we're here and conscious enough to ponder, even if there is such a thing as a multiverse. Um, well, you know, part of the reason I wanted to, to chat to you is because you have a uh, you have a book out called The Allure of the Multiverse, which I, I'm fascinated by. What is the allure of the multiverse to you? What sparked your fascination with the topic? Well, I grew up reading a lot of science fiction, and uh, it's funny if you ask various scientists, do they like science fiction? Um, I find uh, a large percentage do and a large percentage don't. So uh, that kind of divides scientists. And uh, some scientists are, are more imaginative in that way. And others are more hard-headed and say, wait, wait a minute, you know, that's science fiction. That's not physically realistic. Let's not really consider that. And I grew up reading things like, um, you know, Ray Bradbury's story, A Sound of Thunder, which imagined you know, changing history by going back in time. And, um, you know, some other works, Philip K. Dick's Man in the High Castle, and things like that, that imagined what would happen if, if history was different. So that, that fascinated me. And I also read some, uh, some popular nonfiction, such as George Gamow's One, Two, Three, Infinity, which um, looked at ideas such as higher dimensions and I was really fascinated by the idea of the fourth dimension, fifth dimension, and so forth, ideas of going beyond what we see. 
And then when I uh, started university, I became interested in uh, cosmology, and I, I did my PhD thesis in a topic called chaotic cosmology. And for part of that, I actually went to England to University of Sussex, where a great uh, astrophysicist, uh, jo John Barrow, was working there. And he, he set me up with a project involving alternative cosmologies. And I remember him saying, you know, this is a strange model, but it's possible that our universe started out this way. And reading Barrow's works and other works opened me up to the possibility that the universe, the way it looks now, could well have been very, very different in the past. And it could have been, for example, chaotic. It could have been a jumble of possibilities and somehow smoothed out over time into the very regular, very uh, boring in some ways, uh, expansion of the universe we have today. Hmm. You mentioned uh, uh, dimensions as well. Now, to, to my understanding, there's if you if you move around in space, there's X, Y, and Z or Z in in the states, and then there's time. How many dimensions are there? Because I know that's sort of a uh, there's lots of different streams of thought for that. In in your opinion, how many how many types of dimensions are there, and how does that affect how we conceptualize the the multiverse? Well, physicists would all agree that there are, are definitely four dimensions that we can access, uh, meaning, as you said, X, Y, Z, X, Y, Z in, in the States and time. Uh, but also, um, you know, sometimes speculate about higher dimensions. And that goes back to the 19th century, where you have mathematicians such as Riemann and Gauss who mathematically started to develop ideas of higher dimensions, started to extend what we know of as space into other avenues. And um, a way of thinking about that is you keep drawing um, perpendicular angles, but you run out in, in three dimensions. You can only draw three mutually perpendicular uh, lines, uh, but then you go into kind of an imaginary uh, higher dimensional realm. And then you can play with that mathematically. And one way of, of looking at that is thinking of that in terms of projections. So thinking in terms of shadows, uh, because just like if you take a three-dimensional cube and shine a light on it, you can see a shadow on a blank wall. You can imagine a four-dimensional hypercube and shining a light on it and seeing a shadow in three-dimensional space. Mm. And that got the ball rolling in the 19th century with thoughts about mathematical higher dimensions. And strangely enough, as I talk about in my book, that began to inspire thoughts about the spiritual and the mystical. And there was an American uh, medium, so-called psychic medium. He turned out to be a fraud, uh, surprisingly, or maybe not surprisingly. <laughs> named Henry Slade, and he went from America to London and would go to Mayfair and other wealthy neighborhoods and find ladies who were uh, grieving the loss of loved ones, and he would organize seances, and people would sit around the table in the dark, and he would have a slate um, on his lap and, or, or, you know, or held up. Um, under the table somehow, and then he would have everybody hold hands, and they would they would think about the loved one, and then somehow uh, writing would magically appear on the slate with messages from the beyond, and uh, some physicists, uh, particularly Johann Zöllner, who was a German physicist, said, "Oh, the only way he could do that is by contact through the fourth dimension." And uh, Slade also could do these magic tricks with, uh, with untying knots, where two people hold the, the rope on both ends, and the knot magically unties. Hmm. These are standard mag magician tricks, but Zollner wrote a whole book about this on the fourth dimension, saying that this Henry Slade had access to higher dimensions that were, you know, impossible for most people to fathom. And... Um, 
that led to a, a, a negative reaction about the fourth dimension um, because there was a whole trial in London of Slade for, um, for ripping off people, for, for taking people's money and not being, you know, being very uh, honorable about it, not being, not really doing what he said he would do. And, uh, you know, was proven how he did his tricks. And because of that counter reaction to this, these claims, the whole idea of higher dimensions became tainted for a while with the idea that was connected with the spiritual and the mystical. Now, enter Albert Einstein in the early 20th century. He developed uh, the, his special theory of relativity, which is the idea that uh, at, when you go close to the speed of light, time stretches out and space contracts. And another physicist, uh, or a mathematician rather, uh, uh, Herman Minkowski, said, hey, wait a minute, if you could have one thing shrink and the other thing expand, maybe that's a little bit like taking from one and giving to the other. And one way of doing that is to say that space and time are part of a four-dimensional entity called space-time. Mm. And Einstein was dubious because of this mystical connection. And he said, wait a minute, I don't want to talk about this nonsense. But then um, eventually he became convinced that the fourth dimension mathematically is a good way of seeing space-time. And to finish up this, make a long story short, uh, soon thereafter, physicists and mathematicians started saying, hey, wait a minute, if you can uh, talk about the fourth dimension for space-time and, uh, and talk about some forces using the fourth dimension, why not add higher dimensions such as the fifth dimension? And that creates more space to talk about unifying the forces of nature which were then known to be gravitation and electromagnetism within a five-dimensional space-time with some extra dimension that's unseen, perhaps unification can transpire. And that's continued to the present day where some physicists talk about 10 and 11-dimensional realms that, that are large enough uh, or complex enough to unite all the forces of nature. And that's the, uh, the, the, the theory of everything, which um, I guess is the, the sort of holy grail of the physics world. And, and forgive me if I'm wrong, but out of those special forces, it's really, it's really only electromagnetism that as, hum as humanity, we have a bit, bit of a handle on, don't we? Because, uh, you know, things like gravity, we obviously can't control in any way. Do you think, do you think we need to be able to be able to manipulate those sorts of forces if we're able to ever test if there's other dimensions and any of those theories are, are correct, that there's more than four dimensions? Well, we're getting more of a handle on gravitation as well through, uh, remarkably, in, the, in recent years, uh, there have been gravitational wave detectors set up which can detect uh, radiation, gravitational radiation, from colliding black holes and black holes colliding with neutron stars, which is a, something similar to black holes, but not quite as massive. And um, although we, it's it's hard to manipulate gravity in the sense in the same way we do with electricity and magnetism, we know that by moving masses closer together or farther away from each other, that subtly changes gravitational force. And then the two other forces, the strong force and the weak force, uh, take place on the nuclear level, but we certainly can exploit those, for example, uh, in terms of uh, nuclear um, fission and fusion reactions involve those forces. Radiation involves the weak force uh, because it, it causes uh, particles to um, decay within atomic nuclei. So physicists understand those, um, those forces, but the theory of everything would unite them into a single model with a simple set of equations. And so far, there's been more success with electromagnetism, the weak interaction, and the strong interaction mm. uniting those three, but gravity seems the odd force out that it's hard to unite with the other forces using a quantum framework. It's fascinating. And maybe, maybe the advent of AI can help us answer those big questions. Um, 
just thinking well thinking about your book again there's a few concepts in there that i I, I don't really understand. Uh, I've made a couple of notes of them. One is the idea of a bouncing universe. So you mentioned that in the book about universes in multiple dimensions bouncing around. Can you elaborate on that concept and, and how that fits in with multiverse theories? Well, the idea of a bouncing universe goes all the way back to the 1920s and 1930s when um, Edwin Hubble, an American, um, astronomer uh, presented data showing that the universe expands. And then around the same time, uh, Georges Lemaitre, who was a Belgian priest and astronomer, came up with the rudiments of what became known as the Big Bang Theory. And uh, that was the idea that the universe was once very small, the observable universe that we see today. So the natural question was what came before the Big Bang? And George Lemaitre's idea was that you had this primordial atom that was uh, everything mushed together, you know, all matter mushed together in a single ball, but a very tiny ball. Um, but, uh, but then um, people started talking about a point object, everything coming from a point object, which is now called a singularity. But, um, but then if you have a point object, what happened before it? So some models began, uh, were developed by various physicists um, to say, well, maybe there are previous eras of the universe. Uh, Richard Tolman, in particular, a Caltech physicist, came up with the oscillatory model of the universe, saying that before the Big Bang, there are previous eras that collapsed, and then you have a collapse before the expansion. And that was reminiscent in some ways of Eastern religious ideas of of multiple cycles in Hinduism, for example, mm. uh, talks about the creation and destruction of the universe again and again and again. So it has a kind of appeal. Um, the problem with Tolman's model was that you have an entropy buildup, where entropy means disorder, with each cycle. So you have all this waste material and it builds up from cycle to cycle, and eventually everything just stops, um, like kind of throwing, you know garbage into some machine and and then the machine stops functioning uh so um so that was a problem with that model but more recent bouncing models uh including one proposed by roger penrose who's an oxford physicist uh come up with a way of dealing with that penrose's idea brilliantly equates uh at least theoretically uh brilliantly uh, equates um entropy with some term, a mathematical term in Einstein's general theory of relativity. And by setting that term to zero, we can um, say that entropy resets with each cycle. So everything sort of starts anew, and you can have in unlimited cycles. And there's another idea where instead of the things happening in our own universe, you have a kind of multiverse in which you have two hyperplanes. So be imagine something like a sandwich, and the sandwich has some filling inside. So it's a filled sandwich, and um, we live on one slice of bread, and across a higher dimension, an extra dimension, there's another slice of bread, which is another universe that's situated perhaps only a few millimeters from ours across this higher dimension. And then the filling is something which scientists call the bulk. And um, this sandwich uh, collapses periodically. Someone squeezes the two slices together, or some force does, and uh, everything kind of explodes. And that's what the Big Bang is. Periodic crashes between the two hyperplanes. And um, it, that creates cycles through this periodic expansion and contraction along a higher dimension. And that's the, the cyclic cosmology of Paul Steinhardt, Neil Turek, and others. Wow. And the idea of a, a, a sort of parallel universe, it, it, is, there a, is there a theoretical way that we or uh, 
a signal or anything would ever be able to traverse into it. Is it, is it a wormhole? Is it through a black hole? Are there any theoretical ways that one would be able to traverse into? I mean, obviously I've seen interstellar too many times and, uh, you know, that's, that's my assumption of how it would work, but how, what's your thinking around that? Is there, is there, what are the theories or what's your theory? Well, there are ways to talk about parallel universes that, that do imagine some ways of accessing the other parallel universes. So there are a lot of theories out there. Um, one of them, for example, this, uh, idea of the two hyperplanes, which is called, uh, uh, not only bouncing universe, sometimes it's called a brain world, B R A N E world, short for membrane. Uh, brain stands for membrane world idea. Imagines that gravitation leaks from one universe to the other. So you could get theoretically a gravitational signal from another parallel universe. So suddenly you see something that's odd in our universe, but you say, Hey, wait a minute, maybe gravity uh, brought that in from another universe. So that's one way. Wormholes are a construct that uh, were, was developed uh, in the 1950s. The, the notion was proposed by John Wheeler, um, talking originally about black holes. And um, John Wheeler said, well, if you have a black hole, perhaps it opens up a kind of rip in the fabric of our uh, space time, and you, it creates a kind of tunnel that connect, can connect with either another part of our universe or with another universe altogether. But uh, scientists soon showed that if you have a black hole tunnel, it would be non-traversable because once you went in, it would collapse. You would be stretched out like spaghetti. Um, it's called spaghettification. That's a technical term. Uh, stretched in one direction like, like spaghetti. <laughs> yeah, physicists come up with these wild terms for things. Um, and re irradiated. So it wouldn't be very pleasant. Um, so, uh, and you would end up, you know, being dead in short order. Uh, so that would not be a good way to, to cross into another universe. But then Kip Thorne, a theorist, uh, set his his PhD student, uh, a project to say, come up with something better. And uh, Morris, Michael Morris uh, developed this idea of traversable wormholes, which is a way of stabilizing these tunnels using something called exotic matter, which is a negative mass version of matter. Mm. And if you could theoretically construct these, which would require a, a colossal quantity of mass, something like the size of a galaxy. But if you had access to this, maybe Elon Musk or somebody like that would have access to all this material. Um, uh, I'm joking, of course, it'll be beyond the scope of anyone on this planet uh, imaginable in the foreseeable future. But if somebody could do that, perhaps an alien civilization, um, then you could create these tunnels mm. that theoretically could access not just other parts of our universe, but hypothetically access other parallel universes. But it would be very complicated. It wouldn't be like Rick and Morty or, you know, a Marvel character stepping through a door or stepping through some kind of portal and then immediately accessing a parallel universe and seeing some strange, you know, megalomaniac version of themselves <laughs> or evil version of themselves and, and being aghast. Uh, by that, it would it would be quite complicated. You would need a spaceship. You would need a colossal amount of material, or to find something in nature that has that property. And they need to be very, very far away from Earth, mm. because if you tried to set something like this up on Earth, it would destroy Earth. So that wouldn't be very nice. Uh, so you would have to go way, way, way out into deep space to find something like this. Wow, that's pretty crazy. You mentioned Marvel. I just assume that your favorite character is Doctor Strange for obvious reasons. Um, another type of universe, you, you've got the, the, the brain universe, the bounce universe. Um, you mentioned bubble universes in your book. And that's an intriguing concept. Um, 
I think I've seen uh, sort of visuals of how that would look as, as you'd assume it's sort of different universes and different bubbles that don't interact. Um, how, how would these bubble universes interact and, and what implications do they have for our understanding of the cosmos? Yeah, so uh, to clarify, the bubble universes stem from a theory called eternal inflation developed by Andre Linde and others. And this theory says that it's relatively easy to create a universe. All you need is a certain type of energy field. And we assume that in the er very early universe, uh, we imagine the time right after the Big Bang that this, these energy fields are out there. And if the energy field has just the right properties, then suddenly it triggers ultra rapid expansion of the universe. So you would have this segment of the universe blowing up. And that's just, if you just have one of them, it's called the theory of inflation. Mm. And that makes a lot of sense because our universe today, the observable universe is very smooth. It looks the same in all directions. And the idea of, stretching a sheet very rapidly or blowing up a bubble very rapidly um, creates that kind of essential smoothness that we see today. But the problem with that theory or the opportunity, depending on how you look at it, is that it creates all these other bubble universes out there. So you have this bubble bath and um, all these universes, some of them are expanding really rapidly, some of them very slowly, and most of them just end up popping or, or, you know, contracting or expanding so quickly that no planets, no stars, no planets, nothing that we see today can form. And then there's some that you could call the Goldilocks or just right universes mm. that expand at just the right rate to produce uh, clumping matter that eventually creates stars and planets and so forth. And that's the bubble universe idea. And that's one of the key multiverse ideas. The question is, how do you test it? Well, you can't really go out in a spaceship today and travel to other um, universes. Um, it'd just be impossible because of the speed of light limitation. And our universe is expanding very quickly. The other universes will be expanding very quickly. So um, the only way you could see these other universes is to look back in time and look at the early creation of these bubbles, and perhaps during that creation, some of them collided with our universe. And that's a hypothetical model where these bubbles collide with each other. And there are scientists who've been looking at this question, uh, including some from the University of London, looking at the question of scars from the early universe, uh, scars from collisions in the cosmic microwave background which is the radio hiss left over from the Big Bang. And if you had collisions, you would see scars that would uh, be characteristic of collisions with other universes. They'd be looking a little bit like bullseye targets. And um, we haven't found uh, definitive evidence of these, but scientists are still looking uh, for um, examples of such scars. And that would prove, uh, or at least um, suggest the idea of, of early bubble collisions. Fascinating. You're very good at explaining these very complicated concepts. And that's why I think the, uh, the book is so good. And I'll put links in the show notes of how to, 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 to purchase it. Because I, I think it's, a, a lot of people, you know, love talking about deja vus and doppelgangers, but don't really look into it further than that. So I think it's great. And thank you for, uh, for everything you do in that regard. Uh, thinking about the future of multiverse research, where do you see the future um, heading? And what unanswered questions or mysteries are you personally excited to see? You know, what are we, what are we going to see in the next couple of decades in, in, in respect to multiverse research? Well, there are a lot of key questions in cosmology. And uh, particularly, you know, why the universe is expanding the way it does. And in 1998, two teams of astronomers showed experimentally that not only is the universe expanding, but they, that expansion 
is uh, increasing over time. So you have this accelerated growth of the universe. And one uh, way of modeling that is something called the cosmological constant, which was introduced by Einstein and later discarded and then reintroduced by physicists in the 1990s as a kind of anti-gravity term to explain the um, expansion of the accelerated expansion of the universe. But one mystery is why that term is non-zero. So you have this uh, extra force, and sometimes it's also known as dark energy because we don't know what it is. But you have this extra propulsion, which is really, really tiny, just enough to give the universe a bit of a nudge late in its lifetime. So in the first few billion years of the universe, it really didn't have much of an effect. And it's just starting to kick in right now in the later years of the universe. So it's really, really subtle. So the mystery is why you have this subtle extra kick that is that happens later in the life of the universe, but in the early universe, it wasn't really significant enough to alter our destiny, and planets and stars could easily form through clumping because there was nothing out there to prevent that. But mm. now, as the universe moves forward, it will be harder and harder for gravitation to do this um, because things are getting more and more dilute, more disper dispersed, and... Um, Scientists have calculated, if you look at what's called the vacuum energy of the universe, which is the energy of all the material out there, what this cosmological constant should be, and came up with a whopping value of it. So the question is, can scientists develop a theoretical model that explains what, what this dark energy is and what the cosmological constant is and why it's so small but non-zero using all the physics around us, observable physics, or do we have to resort to things like a multiverse by saying, well, maybe we're an odd universe, we're kind of an outlier, and there are all these other universes out there with large cosmological constants, and we just happen to be one with a puny, very, very tiny cosmological constant, but it's small, which is good because that's why we're here today. And that's an argument that's easy to make, but some physicists don't like it because they don't want to talk about non-observable things. But other physicists, such as I interviewed Jim Peebles, Nobel Prize winner, who was uh, key to some of the theoretical work proving the Big Bang. And he said, well, it might be that we have to kind of swallow our pride and say, hey, wait a minute, even though the scientific method is good, we might have to accept some non-observable things just to justify why the observable things we do see are the way they are today. We might have to accept that there's some things that are uh, unknowable just to bolster the structure of the measurable things. Mm. Wow. A lot to think about. And uh, I can't believe it. We've already got through half hour already, which is uh, our normal length of the episode but look, thank you so much for coming on um i could definitely definitely see uh not even a parallel universe but you know another universe where uh you know we talk for longer and uh you know i will i will let everyone know how to <laughs> how to buy your book but um it's a fascinating subject obviously one of the biggest questions that we have and uh what a time to be alive you know i feel like there are going to be some um big leaps in science uh and physics especially over the next few decades Yes. Uh, so my book, Allure of the Multiverse, will be available not just in all universes, all potential universes, but also in bookshops everywhere and online. Uh, so uh, it should be widely available, uh, including in the UK as well as other countries. But this has been a real pleasure. Uh, thank you for your fascinating questions. And it's been great being on your show. Paul Halpern, thank you very much. You're very welcome.